The dream of flying by jet airliner finally came true in the late 1950s. And we're going to tell you the story of the legendary Boeing 707 in this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Bichat. The 707 was originally named the Jet Stratoliner. And we're going to talk about this airplane during commercial aviation's historic transition from props to jets. Boeing had been in the airliner business since 1928. Its first model was the 80A. Then in the 1930s came the model 247, an all metal low wing twin engine airliner. The model 307 followed. This was the world's first pressurized airliner. And you notice the wing and engines are based on the B-17. Then came the model 314, flying boat, which revolutionized air travel in the late 1930s. And this uh, covered the Pacific and opened up air routes to Europe over the Atlantic from the East Coast of the United States. Finally, the last piston powered airliner in Boeing's family was the 377 Strato Cruiser. This was the ultimate luxurious airplane with a lower deck lounge and the spiral staircase that appeared again in the 747 jumbo jet. But in 1954, Boeing uh, had an airplane that revolutionized air travel forever, the model 367-80, or just known as the Dash 80. It was the prototype jet transport, which became the 707. I've talked about the iconic uh, gold cup roll where the 707 was rolled inverted over the city of Seattle uh, during the Seattle Seafair in 1955. I did a painting of it, and there was a video uh, on this uh, painting and the story of how that all came together. I will leave a link for that video at the end of this program. The pilot of that amazing maneuver was Tex Johnston, Boeing's chief test pilot, and he saw an opportunity to demonstrate the airplane over a crowd of 300,000 people and a bunch of airline executives that were on a Boeing yacht anchored in Lake Washington. He rolled the airplane not once, but twice. And the rumor was that he was called on the carpet and immediately fired by the president of Boeing. That wasn't the case. Uh, the flight was made on Sunday, August 7th, 1955. And on Monday morning, uh, Tex was called into the office of Bill Allen, seen here on the right, Boeing's president. Bill asked him, Tex, what were you doing? And Johnston's reply was, I was selling airplanes. Said Alan, you know you can do it. Now we know you can do it. You don't ever have to do it again. And Boeing was on its way to becoming the premier and now only U.S. manufacturer of commercial airliners. By 1956, the company was starting to prepare promotional material for the airlines that had ordered the airplane. And at that time, it was still a five across uh, cabin. Uh, this was eventually widened to six across to compete with the Douglas DC-8. The ground equipment for the 707 was extensive. Fuel trucks, uh, water injection trucks, galley service. Uh, it was really a, a full ramp of equipment. And this is in the days before modern terminals and jetways. The blast of the engines was a serious problem. And again, uh, in uh, ramp tight spaces near a terminal with the people boarding a jet Another one next to it turning uh, posed quite a problem. The first 707, the Model 120, flew in December of 1957. It was powered by 14,000 pound thrust Pratt & Whitney JT3A turbojets. It had a range of 3,000 miles. So the dream finally came true. And here we see the TWA 707, and this is called a 131. Each airline had its own code number. So the technical, uh, designation of this airplane is a 707-120 for TWA. It's a 707-131, rolling out of uh, the final assembly building on a typical rainy day in Seattle, but a beautiful airplane. The color scheme was designed by Raymond Lowy, and as one pilot described it, the jet looked like it was doing 600 miles an hour just sitting on the ground. American was another early customer. Their uh, number was 23, so this is a 707-123. And Pan Am was the original launch customer of the airplane. 
and uh, there was uh, their number is 21. So this is a 707-121, but it's the original configuration of the airplane and Pan Am was the first to put it into operation. At that time, there was a race uh, across the Atlantic, uh, which, co which country and which airline would be the first to have uh, transatlantic jet service and the uh, British Comet 4, which was an evolution of the original Comet 1, which first flew in 1952, uh, actually won that race on Saturday, October 4th, 1958. Here we see it at Idlewild, kind of a prophetic photo with the uh, Lockheed Constellation on the other side of the blast fence. But the Comet arrived uh, on that morning and uh, not to be outdone, Pan American President Juan Tripp ordered a 707 parked at the gate next to where the Comet landed. This is the International Arrivals Building, or IAB, at uh, Idlewild. If you look on the right, you see a crowd of many hundreds, if not thousands of people that had turned out to see the first jets in the world land at the airport. And my family was amongst uh, that crowd. It was a momentous day and something I'll never forget. I was uh, 11 years old. My father took this photo. Uh, rather ironic that the DC-7 is taking off in the background. But I will tell you, aside from smelling kerosene for the first time on an airport ramp, and uh, of course the roar of the crowd and the roar of the engines, uh, it, it was like seeing a spaceship. It was just the, the, the beginning of the future. It was just a momentous day. To put it in perspective, this is what a ramp looked like that year. You've got this elegant Lockheed TWA Super G Constellation and DC-7s uh, on the other side of the ramp. And this was a typical scene at an airport. So look at this machine by comparison, really advanced. On October 26th, Pan Am flew their first jet flight from New York to Paris. And this is an interesting trivia question. What was the first airline to fly a scheduled jet service within the United States? The answer will surprise you. It was national. Now for your airliner guys out there, you're gonna say national, national flew DC-8s. Well, they did about a year later, but in December of 1958, they worked out an amazing deal with Pan Am to wet lease the 707. And here's how it worked. Pan Am flew in from Europe in the morning. National took the airplane to Miami from New York. And again, this is the winter time just before the holidays. Uh, they arrived there after lunch, turned the airplane around, came back to New York by dinner time, and Pan Am then took the airplane to Europe in the evening. What a neat arrangement. The airports of the future hadn't uh, been built yet. Uh, this is LAX in a rendering, and this airport was still a year or two away. So what that meant was that the jets had to operate on the original ramps from the old terminals. And this proved uh, challenging. Again, you had all that uh, ground equipment and here's what it looked like in operation. You had a fuel truck under each wing, the water truck uh, at the trailing edge of the left wing. Why did it need a water truck? This wasn't for the galley. This was 5,000 gallons pumped into the engines during takeoff for boosting the thrust. And we're gonna see the result of that in a few moments. The jet blast, as I'd mentioned, was a serious problem with uh, one engine oper one airplane operating and passengers boarding uh, an adjacent airplane. So the solution was to park the jet at the end of what they call the sheep run or the finger of the terminal. Here's LAX in 1959. And they put the 707 at the, all the way at the end uh, so that they could tow it out onto a taxiway, start the engines and taxi it out for takeoff. So that meant you would uh, walk out on the ramp and go up the boarding stairs. From the top of the stairs, you'd turn around and look back at that ramp. It was all piston powered airplanes. Again, this is 1959. It may seem odd, but there were times when there would be one or two jets per day at each of these major airports in the very beginning of jet travel. And here we see the first, the takeoff for the first transcontinental US flight by jet, an American Airlines 707 from LAX to New York. And this photo was taken from Imperial Boulevard on what is today called Spotters Hill. It's a beautiful overlook of LAX. But you notice in 1959, there wasn't much there. 
you remember I'd mentioned the water truck. This is the result. It's just thick, acrid black smoke that would uh, pour out of those engines uh, on takeoff. And in those days, everybody looked at it and said, well, it's a jet. That's what they look like. And I have to tell you also, uh, this is a six degree climb out angle compared to the piston airliners, three degrees. This airplane looked like it was going straight up. It's all relative. When it landed in New York, the 707 parked on the other side of where you see the TWA Connie at the end of that sheep run, far away from the, uh, the other prop liners. American operated from the north end of the old terminal. TWA had their jets parked out on the ramp on the south end. Very different than what it looks like today. The international flights arrived at the IAB or International Arrivals Building and you see the new tower there at uh, Idlewild. I should mention Idlewild became JFK uh, in 1963. The 707-120 uh, could fly to Europe nonstop eastbound if the winds were right, but on the return leg, it had to stop either at Shannon, Ireland or uh, Gander, Newfoundland to refuel to make it into New York. It also had five cockpit crew members, all men in those days, a pilot, a co-pilot, a flight engineer, a radio operator, and a navigator for international travel. Quite different than today. So what do these airplanes have in common with the Boeing 707? Well, they all share the same engine. The military derivation is the J-57. And from upper left, you have the North American F-100 Super Sabre, the Convair F-102 Delta Dagger. Uh, at bottom left, the Vought F-8 Crusader and the Douglas F-4D Sky Ray all used the J-57 engine, the military version of the 707 power plant. In 1958, the 707-320 series or the Intercontinental made its first flight. And this became a game, this was a game changer. This became the first airplane to try, be able to go in both directions nonstop over the Atlantic. It was powered by uh, 18,000 pound thrust Pratt & Whitney JT-4A turbojets and it had a range of 4,000 miles. Here we see an Air France 707-320. You can see the slightly different shape of the engine nacelles and pylons. And these are the airplanes that shared that engine. The military version was the J-75. From upper left, the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, Convair F-106 Delta Dart, Lower left, North American F-107 prototype. And, oh, wait, that looks like an SR-71, but it's the A-12. It's the ship one, the very first prototype used by the CIA before the Air Force uh, created the SR-71. And the first prototype of that airplane was flown with Pratt & Whitney J-75s because the uh, J-58 engine that became operational was not uh, fully ready yet. So please don't write any comments. I know the Blackbird was powered by the, uh, the J-58, but the prototype flew with J-75s. A unique version of the 707 was built for Qantas uh, to be able to give the airplane range to uh, cross the Pacific. And this was the model 138 used only by this airline. What they did is they shortened the fuselage by 10 feet, but gave it the upgraded engines. And so this gave it a uh, much greater range. The last uh, in the series of original 707s was the 420, which is the same as a 320 Intercontinental, but powered by Rolls-Royce Conway engines. And the final member of the family, a smaller brother uh, to the 707, the 720. This was uh, nine feet shorter than the standard airplane, but uh, was much lighter in weight and had a slightly different wing. This allowed operations from shorter runways in smaller towns, and this became Boeing's medium range jetliner, uh, the first in the concept of building a family of airplanes that eventually included the 727, 737, and so on. The 720 had a unique outer pylon. It didn't have the turbo compressor that you see on the inboard pylon. And here we see it with the straight turbo jet. But then came the turbo fan, the JT3D. And this was an upgraded engine allowed more thrust, it was quieter. You notice it doesn't need the noise suppressors you saw on the uh, original version. And it was just an all around improvement in uh, every way. 
This is a TWA airplane and their uh, marketing name was Dynafan engine. And there it is, the Boeing 707. This is a 131B. And the ultimate 707, the 320, uh, this is a C model for cargo. And technically it's a CF, convertible freighter. It's got the freight door. It can be used as an all freight airplane and it can be converted to a passenger configuration, six across for military charter, which is exactly what uh, I flew on this very airplane uh, from uh, Travis Air Force Base in San Francisco to Yokota Air Base in Japan when I was in the Air Force. Beautiful machine. This also became the basis for the military variants of the 707. And by the way, that's not the KC-135. The fastest and largest jetliner to Europe. The dream of an intercontinental jetliner came true. There's the 707 uh, 320. Oh, you remember that American flight from LAX taking off on runway 25? Well, here's a photo taken from approximately that same place. And here's what LAX looks like today. It's ironic that in the background is the terminal for American Airlines. All this progress was made possible by a revolutionary airplane, the Boeing 707. And there you have it, the story of a, an amazing machine that changed air travel forever. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. And as always, special thanks to the great uh, folks and organizations that made this uh, video possible. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and until next time, take care.